Hey. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nancy Blair. Uh, I'm Blair Teach on Twitter. I'll put it in the box here in a moment. <laughs> and we are about to begin our session on, on uh, transforming classroom practice with iPad content integration with Naomi Harm. Uh, Naomi is best known as a 21st century educational technology literary, literacy specialist. Um, she's an enthusiast and guru who welcomes every opportunity to share her expertise and best practices relating technology infused in teaching and learning environments. Uh, um, she is a motivational keynote speaker uh, internationally and focuses on emerging technologies, 21st century skills and assessments. 21st Century Administrative Leadership, and Inspired and Transformative Educational Technology Leadership. She is truly passionate about building global relationships with educational technology leaders while engaging in meaningful and collaborative conversations to meet the needs of today's diverse learners. So we'll all sit back and learn from Naomi and enjoy the presentation this morning. Naomi, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Nancy. It's great to be here with all of you. And we will get started um, in which that we will be looking at and really having a great discussion around transforming classroom practice with iPad content integration. Even though there is a focus today on pre-K through kindergarten focus through elementary, uh, we do a lot of teaching as well with our middle school, high school students as well that you can carry over and make this relevant as well. So as we continue on, uh, Nancy did a good job already introducing me and uh, my background of what I'm currently doing around the world. I do a lot of things nationally and internationally, but first and foremost, I am an educator and I'm a very proud educator to work with students, to team teach with teachers, and to co-facilitate with administrators. So I just want to share that with you as well, too. Some of you may say, well, Naomi, you're in Minnesota. A lot of countries say right now, where is that in location um, within North America? So I have a map here to showcase to you where Minnesota is in regards to our lovely 50 states that we have. And as you can see, I am in the northern sector of Minnesota, but in one day I can travel through three states. I live right in the southeast corner of Minnesota, as you can see where I'm located at, but I can also travel 15 miles to the south to be in Iowa. I also can be 15 miles um, and continue to the east to go to Wisconsin. So there's many times that I can travel through three states in one day. Um, I live right on the beautiful Mississippi River, and here's our location just to give you some proximity because it's very interesting to note where people live in the world. And as part of that, we have the beautiful four seasons in which that I can share with you. Um, our fall, as you can see in the top left corner, um, and we do have some gray and dreary days, but it's still beautiful fall. As you can see, this is our view from our dock, which is right adjacent to our house. You can also see that we have a wintertime wonderland in which that, that beautiful bay turns into a natural ice skating rink, and so we skate there for about five months in the winter months. We also have a beautiful spring and a lovely summer, but some of you noticed as well too, our beautiful summer also brings rattlesnakes to our area. So on my YouTube videos that I had, we had a rattlesnake here last month that was very dangerous, a timber rattler, and just recently, 15 miles from my home, a gentleman was bit. Um, last week and he's still in the hospital. So we have to be very careful. We've got many lovely animals, but many dangerous animals in our area too. Um, but just wanted to share with you, we have the beautiful Four Seasons located in, again, um, that beautiful Minnesota area. Come and join us anytime if you're in the area. I'd love to entertain, um, so please feel free to come as well. As part of this, I wanted to share with you, I cannot be knowledgeable as well as with the people around me. They've shared so much wealth of their knowledge to help me with my training that I do globally right now. My individuals that I have some key great friends and great specialists that I kind of have tucked away in my back pocket that I converse with to have those conversations to help me. Uh, Jan Wee from the Holman School District, she's the technology director. We are assisting her currently with a pilot program with pre-K and early childhood. And, um, she's been my mentor throughout the years, but a wonderful individual to converse with, to learn with, and to build this great pilot project that we have going. 
Dan King also, he is an iPad training specialist and he works for my consulting company and he has 30 years of experience as a tech coordinator, but also is just a truly great Mac specialist and he's doing a lot of our iPad trainings. I wanted to thank all of you as well for my Wisconsin school districts that I work with, but also my global PLN, because you constantly share with me your knowledge and as part of that, um, it's added to our iPad overview of our training that we've worked with, which has been amazing. Scott Meech is from the Chicago area, from Illinois, who's done a great job that we've conversed and helped one another out, and Sam Giltzman, also from the iPad Educator Social Network. Two great guys to work with in which that they've shared their knowledge and we've shared some blog reflections together to help educate everyone globally about the impact of iPad technologies. So a special thanks to them. I can only be as good as the people that I surround myself with and those are my um, great four individuals that I, I say that they are great experts that I can converse with. As we continue on, I wanted to give you some background information of what we're currently doing in some of our pilot programs to get started. And the focus truly is on iPad content integration. And we're really looking at what we can do to transform classroom practice in which that the technology is not just a standalone tool, it's an essential vehicle to infuse the content and the technology literacy with information to help make meaningful connections to student learning. We also are really focusing on this pilot program with our students at the Holman School District is the pre-K through elementary, but we have a great initiative taking place and kind of in about 30 miles from here too in Bangor, Wisconsin, and that's where I originally had my teaching practice at and worked at for seven years um, as a classroom educator, and they just recently purchased um, 140 iPads for their middle school students. And as part of that, some of you are saying, how are they getting the money and what are they doing? How can they do that? Well, a lot of our districts right now are not renewing their textbook dollars. That could be 75000 or or 100000 Instead, right now, they are purchasing iPads as that digital tool for, for their transport, to, for ebook learning, for content integration, and meaningful practice for students, for mobile technology, for 24-7 access to the content. So it is just amazing. And as we continue on to give you a little bit more background knowledge, our main focus is always student-centered. And I think that is where um, the intuitiveness of where iPad Technologies is coming is that we're not losing the sight of what is going to make a difference with our children. And as part of this, it really is, it's to expand their learning experience. It's to enrich their learning environment but we're really focusing on individualization and to help students with a differentiated approach in which that we're meeting all of their needs. And at this given time, it is really enriching the curriculum. What we also have as well as part of this, I will give you a site later on in the presentation in which that I have lots of resources for you on differentiation approaches, overall curriculum integration, and different strategies to implement with iPad technologies at any grade level for your students. So even though this is um, pre-K through elementary we're focusing on today, I do have an expanded content collection all the way through college and university years with students as well too. So I see someone lost some audio, so I'm sorry. I hope it comes back quickly too. Nancy, I'm going to take a break just a minute here. Are you still hearing me for audio? Yes, I am. Sometimes okay. you need to exit and come back in when the audio slips out. Okay. So individuals, those that you are chatting in, in case that you lost the audio, maybe somebody could type it in there to tell them to sign out, sign back in, um, just so that you can be part of that. Thanks for helping with that, everyone. As we continue on, the biggest focus that we've worked with school districts is we have to start with the end in mind. What is it that we truly want to know and to help students learn with a student learning outcome? Even though we're using iPad technologies as a, de as a device to help us be that vehicle of knowledge, we need to really focus on what is it truly that we want students to know. So as part of that, we focus on individual student learning outcomes. In the United States, we have an acronym that's called an IEP, which stands for that, those individual educational plans. We even have indica individual education plans for teachers, 
but that's to help them stay focused on technology literacy and to improve their skill sets. But with our students, we want to make sure that every child is successful in their learning. So as part of that, we use those IEPs to help us really cultivate that learning, staying on track, and to monitor that progress. But we also look at right now, how can we help our kids? What can we do um, with the kids for the technology literacy standards to help them be successful? So we're looking at ISTE NETS and ISTE stands for the International Society for Technology and Education. We use those nets that are focused on pre-K through 2, or we focus on 3 through 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12. As part of that, too, we focus on the 21st century skills for students. We want to make sure that the learning is highly collaborative, highly communicative, and that it is self-directed, that students are responsible for their learning. So we're infusing all of those facets into that learning environment to helping kids be successful with ownership in their learning. As part of this too, working with Jan Wee at the Holman School District, we also infuse what's called the Technology and Early Childhood Programs. And I have that document as a link um, that has been generated about the importance of students to understand the information, media, and literacy within their true content and curriculum within that early childhood development to make sure that we are targeting um, the social, emotional, and developmental skills for those early children as well. As we continue on, we look at the assessment component too. We need to make sure that when introduced to the appropriate iPad apps that we work with students and those student learning outcomes, we need to make sure that we have key indicators of benchmarks along the way, that we are assessing students to making sure that they're making true connections. We do not want students to be unsuccessful or fall between the cracks. We want to make sure that we're um, introducing assessments that are key and relevant that are making sense to children to monitor their own progress. When we look at this, we really look at the quality and content of grade level apps for students. Um, uh, other resources that we use, I have a collection list I put together for you, really focused on reading, math, science, social studies, and special education apps that I will get to in a minute. But we look at, too, um, I really enjoy Kathy Schrock's iPad website that she has because it's really focused on content specific and grade level specific. But what I like about it is that Kathy has developed with others rubrics and checklists to making sure those apps are relevant, they are true in nature to meet a student learning outcome, and that it is relevant to meet the content and literacy needs of all of our children. So as part of this, um, we also have created what's called a Google Form, and many of you may be familiar with that, but the Google Form is used as an interactive student walkthrough assessment for children. We work with our administrators to do walkthroughs with teachers, but we also work with our students in which we have a Google Interactive Form on an iPad that students can instantly assess what's happening, taking place in that constructive play, with that iPad app or in, if they're in a literacy-centered group with an app, noting for that we're looking at information fluency, developmental display of language. We're also looking at interact and, and interaction and positive and reflective and responsive communication skills with students. And so as part of that, when students are working with that checklist or the teacher is, it's instantly collating that data that we can make change to the lesson to see if kids are making a connection or what we need to do the next day to modify that instruction, which is very important as well. And thanks to many of you for sharing those interactive sites as well with Kathy Schrock that I mentioned. Paula, thank you so much. Um, those will be noted at the end of this as well, too. And I, I greatly appreciate your efforts to share your knowledge with us. Thank you. Professional development is key when it comes to any of this. It's so important anytime that when a technology initiative is launched in a district or in your setting, that it's important that professional development is the main stay at the front of this. So many times I hear districts that they say they deploy the technology and there's very little time on the professional development. We knew right away from the forefront that we needed to get the buy-in from our administrators and our teachers, and professional development was the key. We've spent many days working with professional development and customized it to meet the teacher's needs so that they felt at ease with this. 
We focused on afternoon, like half day sessions. We've worked on after school sessions that they can come and we feed them great food so they feel comfortable coming and enjoying that conversation. But we make sure that they have ongoing trainings, that it's just not a one-time deal, that they have connections. This next fall, we are actually creating called iPad Learning Symposiums that we meet together on weekends or after school to have collective schools come together and share best practices through roundtables and birds of a feather and knowing that they can come in, in a very at ease setting with great food and knowing that they have conversation with colleagues and coming with teacher teams to share their knowledge too. That, that is essential, that they are not feeling like a lone ranger, but knowing that they can work together as a dynamic duo or in a collective team. We also, at the beginning with this professional development, we've had great full, full support from administrators on the forefront, and they are there in this training with their teachers. They're just as actively involved as a teacher deploying an iPad initiative in her, his or her district. That administrator is there fully supporting them, and that is why we have been so successful, because of the administrator support. They, too, do not want to be left behind, and that's what's amazing with this. Um, you will be getting this early childhood link of the project that we've deployed. Jan Lee has done a really nice job that we've worked with with the iPad and interactive whiteboard project. So you can see their progress. You'll see their success stories. We'll see our setbacks, but also what we've done to make change to be successful. Again, all of the trainings that we've offered, very much hands-on, minds-on training, specific content apps to really help with the social, emotional, and information fluency development for the students that we're working with. And EC stands for, again, Early Childhood. That's what that stands for that we're using in the United States. 4K means that these are four-year-olds coming into a kindergarten program, preparing them to be at that full kindergarten program when they're five years old. So thanks for that, for distinguishing those as well. Whoa, we went out a little bit here. Let me back up. Sorry about that. Um, getting back to where we were, um, the educator resources as well. Educators are trained on the forefront with a magnitude and a multitude of online quality resources. The resources that we use are from educational experts from around the world so that we're to tapping into not only local experts, whether it's in, we call it the Midwest area, which encompasses Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. We also go to global experts, knowing and learning from others, especially from pilot projects from the UK, anywhere from Australia to Japan, and also all the way over to South Africa. So we're using global experts to help learn from their success stories, maybe some of their setbacks, so that our learning curve, we're not starting at ground zero, we're starting halfway up. We're also empowering teachers to be educational leaders. After our trainings, knowing that they each can be an expert in a given area, they don't have to know it all, but they can focus on a, on a given area that they can share their knowledge in their teams with groups of teachers as well, too. Absolutely. And as we continue on, we want to keep our eye on the prize, and that is our students. Um, our students are always focused in on all of our trainings. Even if our trainings with children are not there for team teaching, our students, is what we're looking at is what is that student learning outcome? How do we know that we're meeting the standards? And what kinds of types of walkthrough or interactive checklists can we verify that we know that children are retaining information, showing growth over time, and that we are assisting their needs to be a successful digital citizen in that classroom? The different types of apps that we're currently using truly do help the students with that immediacy of engagement and motivation right away. They can interact. There's little instruction sometimes with those apps, but the teacher is there as that guide and that facilitator on the side, but also will interact when they need to. The point of our students with the learning, we want the students to share. We want the students to ask the questions. And if the students are struggling in a way, the teachers will ask more probing questions to get at the heart of the learning. So it's based on essential questions, 
content questions, and as well to get the kids thinking differently about how they're interacting. We are reinforcing and extending the content knowledge skills of the students in Wisconsin. We have standards related to 4K as well, and as part of that, that early childhood, which is that EC again for that acronym, that we're really looking at how are the children retaining information and showcasing what they know. As part of this as well, we're looking at social and emotional skills development, and we're really looking at the language development for children to help improve with fluency and how they interact in a group and documenting if, if there's any delay or setback, but what we can do to find the right app to help them improve that fluency skill set as part of this. We have a great list for you today, too. Um, I have a, a link as well to share with you many resources and many of our training, but on my BoxNet Global Shared folder, as you can see there, it's box.net slash Naomi Harm. I've got a list in there that's for you that, as you can see, that's developed that we're working with the information fluency. Um, and as part of the information fluency, uh, we're working on ABCs, language and literacy arts, math, music, science, and social skill development with special education. At this site that I have for you, this pre-K through K list, every one of the items that we've shared on here is linked to take you back out to the iTunes gallery. It will note um, also if it's for a cost or if it's free. And then when it's linked back to the iTunes gallery, it will give you the overview of the student learning outcome of what will be used with that app. These are some of the best of the best apps that we've put together to really help focus on that pre-K through K setting for our students. And we've been quite successful with even using some of their called light versions as L-I-T-E, meaning light. It's not the full version, but it's still free. Teachers can dig into that light version and really see if that app is appropriate for that teaching and learning setting. If they like that, then they will download that app for the full version and pay for that cost as well. In the United States here, we also use it's called the VPP, the Volume Purchasing Program. And with that Volume Purchasing Program, when it's set up, we've empowered teachers to be facilitators who have worked with the program managers that all of the apps can be deployed easily within the course of even like 24 hours. So if a teacher really wants an app and she'd like to have it on her iPad by the next day, we have a process in place that she can request that app and immediately be by the next day that she can have access to it. A lot of times in our, our educational system, sometimes there's only one person that's in control of all of that. And what happens is then um, it may take a week or two before that app can be deployed back on that iPad. So that's a whole other area that we can talk about, but that will take a lot of time. But I just wanted to share with you, um, we have a process in place that we're empowering teachers in which it goes through kind of a review process to say, yep, this is the app, this is what I know, it can do the job for my student, and then it's already deployed by the next day that they can use it in their classroom instruction. As we continue on, um, as part of this iPad list, as the third page, I've got a very special collection for all of you. This collection also has a large component in which that you can tap into educational apps that are shared and reviewed with others online. Like I mentioned Scott Meach earlier at iEar.org, he does a really nice job that he does iPad app reviews. So you can see and look at the app and really integrate within your content um, before you maybe will deploy it with the students because you want to make sure that app will do the right job for you to get at the heart of learning. Other applications that we have here, I've got a collection of experts to tap into. I mentioned earlier um, Kathy Schrock, who does a marvelous job um, with, with the iPad Bloomin apps that she's put together. Tony Vincent's another wonderful gentleman as well from Nebraska, kind of in our, our Midwest area. But as you can see on this list, and all of these are clickable, it will take you right to their site, or it will take you right to the social network of the online communities, or the research articles that I've mentioned previous of where we're at for the deployment of iPad content integration in that K-12 through classroom. And again, we also have a lot of districts that will say, well, Naomi, even though you've deployed, deployed that iPad content integration within a school district, how did you start? 
I want to know where do I go so I can start when I'm at the beginning stage and where can I go to the next stage. So I've got a collection again in my BoxNet slash Naomi Harm file that as you can see as the link on here about one-to-one -one deployment or group deployment if you're only integrating five or six in a classroom. We also have policies as well too. A lot of our districts need to have policies in place and those policies in which to protect and making sure that our students are safe, using the tools in an ethical manner, and showcasing their mannerisms of digital citizenship effectively in the classroom. Again, here's a screenshot of my one-to-one -one and iPad policy folder that when you get to my BoxNet file, it will be called the RF. CON3 iPad folder, and you will see that we will have a great collection of iPad policies. I have a whole folder on transforming classroom practice with iPad content and lots of resources and handouts for you. I also have the ISTE net that I noted earlier of talking about standards and integration with assessment. And I also have a great collection that we're using with teachers to showcase their literacy knowledge of iPad content integration with templates. So we have a form that they go through that process to truly to make it an interactive lesson to transform their learning practice in their classroom. So you can download any of those, you can modify any of those, and you can share them with your teacher teams as well that you'd have those. Experts cited in what I've listed earlier there are lots of things that you can use in your classroom. Dan King is my colleague that I work with, and he's done a really nice job at danking.net, and that's one of our main training sites that we use for pre-K all the way through university levels of teaching and learning. Lists lots of links, processes, and how to deploy that integration in the classroom. As you can see, I mentioned Jan Wee earlier. I want to give her credit where credit is due. It's called EdTech for Me, and that's the iPad technology project that we're working with in her classroom and her school district right now for early childhood 4K. Other areas to tap into the other gentlemen that I mentioned, so please tap into any of those that you'd like from my, my handout that I have. Other resources that I mentioned, I wanted to make sure that you have full access to all of these resources and all the early childhood um, information and especially the last one of the draft of where we went from of how to start that pre-K through K program and looking at those particular tools. There are so many iPad apps out there it is almost overwhelming but going back into my BoxNet site that I shared underneath the pre-K apps there's so many to really enhance the literacy and inf information literacy with students in the classroom that you can really tap into. And as we continue on, um, my contact information that I have here for you before we'll take some questions and answers that I have is that I Naomi, I don't know about the other people, but you froze up and I can't hear you. If you can hear me, you might want to cut your video off for a moment and try. Okay, it looks like we have a, it looks like perhaps Naomi lost her signal and she likely will try and log right back in again. Uh, Ryan, I see you have a question. I'm going to give you the microphone if you would like to ask a question and we'll see if uh, Paula or, or Ian or I could answer your question while we're waiting for Naomi to get back in. Ryan, if you want to ask a question by using the microphone, you need to click on the little F2 button down at the bottom or type it in the box. Paula, I've given you a microphone if you would like to try and answer any of these questions or um, 
that are coming through the chat box while we're trying to wait for Naomi to re, uh, reconnect. I see. I'm kind of all of a sudden it started going really fast. Um, I don't know how many of the um, iPad programs are allowing the children to actually take them home. I know here in the New Orleans area, the Archdiocese of New Orleans is um, giving the students iPads, and um, they, of course, they're going to be taking those home. But as far as um, what's happening in other areas, I'm not sure. Um, what else? As far as the, um, the oh, here she comes. Okay, I'll, I'll drop the mic. Okay, Naomi, I don't know if you have an opportunity to swing through those questions uh, if you in the chat box. Um, and if I don't see that you've covered some, I've copied some into a document, and I'll, I'll ask them at the end. So go ahead. We'll put you back on. Uh, Naomi, I don't have any audio yet. Have you clicked your mic? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Um, sorry, everyone. I don't know what happened. I was just totally booted out. So thanks for your for your time. Um, right now, I'm addressing one of the questions I believe Paula left out on. Um, in some of our districts, our younger students are still keeping the iPads intact in the classrooms. They're using them there. They're not checking them out. Some of our older students in our pilot project at the Bangor Middle School project, they will be taking them home. It will be a 24-7 mobile device. And part of that policy is to help kids and to model that in which that they will be um, using that device in the home environment and bringing back and forth to school. They need to model the appropriate digital citizenship and ethical use of a technology tool. So that's as part of that as well. So I hope I addressed that question. Um, someone also says you have to purchase an app for each um, iPad. Part of the VPP, if you purchase 20 apps of one kind, it will be reduced down to 50%. That's why we've deployed that program in many of the Naomi, you froze up and we lost you again. The districts that we're working with to save on dollars for districts. And it really helps track the accountability, too, that you are legal on your license with the iPad apps as well. OK. Um, Nancy, was there another question? Am I here? Yeah, yeah you're Can here. You Hang on just a second. I'll I flip over to another page. Nancy, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, somebody asked if uh, are are there too many apps? When okay. is too enough? Too much? Thanks for your patience, everyone. I don't know what's happening, but we're going to try our best to answer your questions as they come up. Right. Sometimes there are too many apps. And sometimes we do start small with teachers that we focus on maybe two or three apps in each content area. It's always best to start small, and you can always build upon that as well. Otherwise, you will be, be, you will be overwhelmed with all that is out there. M making sure that it meets that student learning outcome can help minimize um, some of those setbacks as well, too. So starting with two or three apps with each content area, and then if you're really looking for even a multimedia project, um, some ones we've been using with students to give ownership into creating something that's very creative, we've used Screen Chomp, or we've used Show Me, in which that students can bring in a picture they've taken. They can write over on top of the picture to annotate, but also record their voice to share their knowledge about the story Thank that you. they're There's creating. Another question up here. So those two are free as well, which have been very useful for our students. Do you have a special sync device, somebody's asking. We have dedicated um, areas in our districts right now that we have a Yeah, we have a dedicated special sync device in which that we're using a dedicated Mac computer or a Windows computer. It does not matter which operating system it is. And that we're syncing those with CART's 
um, of your iPads, or we will have an adaptive or an adaptive device as a USB hub that you can have seven um, syncing at one time. But we're really mass uh, managing it using also the iPhone config utility tool that can help set your preferences and your profile set up with that dedicated device, and then everyone gets deployed that same image. The iPhone Config Utility is a free software um, that is deployed through Apple, but that is free. Some of our districts are using otherwise. It's called Absolute Solutions Software. Thank you. Somebody or, asked, um, uh, have any, any of these programs and looked at the Solutions impact of parents? It's $7.50 per device, and Casper is $10 per device. Yes, the parent involvement is very important with this. As part of our home and deployment, um, parents were actively involved on the forefront, and they wanted these tools for their students because they could see the engagement and motivation and the learning process that took place. And just like we have for administrators, the buy-in at the beginning, the parents were involved as well. And it was a community project as well. And as soon as you have all of that buy-in, you've got such great support in which to share back what's been happening. It helps, too, because once those students start at that younger level, those parents will follow those children through elementary, middle school, and high school. We also have a question and we'll be asking extremely about the supportive on the way through their educational the journey, which when new tools come to be, they'll be more supportive. And that buying is very important. Yes, there are a lot of apps that will still work between your iPods and iPads. When you go to the iTunes store, you have the choice now that you can differentiate between them using iPads and iPods. You can even load iPod apps on iPads, but the display will come up as it's playing back on an iPod is what it will do. Um, it's not necessarily that you want to download an iPad app onto an iPod. It's not quite going um, both ways. But you can get both iPods and iPad apps to work on iPads, um, and, it, and it's highly interactive. The new apps that are coming out, there's many versions still with an yes, iPad app and making that the other version for the iPod if you had that set for classroom. Simple has the little well plus too. sign in it, on it, then it's compatible with both. So that it will, on the iPad, be the full-size version and work also on the iPod or the iPhone. Uh, there's a question back here about training for parents mm -hmm. about how to use the iPad with their children to support what's going on in the classroom. Right. How common is that or is it happening? Um, it is common um, and I wish it was I wish it was more done because that's where that buy-in comes in from the parents. It has been introduced at, we call them PTO nights, which is parent-teacher organizations. We have those in the United States and in which a lot of times children will come in to showcase to the PTO and have a family night as well too. And they will come in and actually the, t the students are in charge in which to share their knowledge about the devices. So it's student-led instead of teacher-led. The teacher is there as the facilitator, but the students lead oh, to do you. the Mark training. Day. Asked, for those of you the using individuals iPads, of the you PTO have staff over and the apps. parents that are coming and in, in her the situation, community. she doesn't, and it's a frustration. I totally understand, Barbara, as part of that. The trainings that we offer, like I said, we do the program manager and program facilitator. When we deploy our training, we empower our teachers. We take that role off of the IT directors. Their job, they are so busy anyway. It really needs to be the teachers as program facilitators to be loading the apps on. It doesn't take too much time once the process is down. It really doesn't because the teachers are the content experts. If an IT director does not have an educational background, um, that is where the hang-up usually happens. That's why the program, to have the program manager and facilitator as educators to empower the teachers, they are the content experts. They should be choosing okay, the thank apps you. And, and getting them on the iPad. Okay, thank you. And someone asked a question about 
no, no, and I just skipped here. Okay. About limiting the number of um, apps on an iPad. Okay. Yeah, actually, um, I have a, a iPad 2. I have a base unit that's the $500 one that's the 16 gigs. I have right now close to 200 apps in folders according to content specific areas to work with the student and it's almost full. And each app is a different size in storage wise so that's what you need to look at too. So when I'm demoing and showcasing my iPad's almost full so I can't put any more videos on it or any more music because it's full of apps at this time. But using the power within your iTunes software, you can choose immediately which apps you want to sync and which apps that you don't want to sync. So you can still have a very large collection and create a new image after you sync that. But using the power in the iTunes software from your control station of your computer, you can really differentiate which sections that you Thank want you. to create a profile. Have answered so using that to leverage But it was, as can well. you have all the iPads have the same apps in the same order? Absolutely, and that's why using, again, that power of that iTunes software, you can deploy that image, and I would, I would really recommend doing, setting everything up on your computer first, setting your image first, and then organizing that, and then when you sync, when you plug in your other iPads related to whether it's a cart specific or you're using that USB hub, you'll see all that lineup come into your iTunes library, and everyone can have the exact same in, image deployed very quickly. And that's what we're doing Thank to save you. on time right now kind of for our teachers. a two-part question regarding number of apps limited for the kids, but you did kind okay. of address that earlier. The second part of the question is, do you change them on a monthly basis? In other mm -hmm. words, do you have some kind of a rotation of apps, or, or do you just put them on and that's what's there? Right now, how we have it in the school district, we've, we have deployed one main image based on the insight and collection of the teacher voice of what they need. Anytime that something needs to be added, the program facilitator is contacted by that end user of a teacher, and the program facilitator, who's our lead teacher, she will deploy that out instantly by the next day, or if it's not by the next day, sometimes we say, okay, it's app day. App days on Tuesday, so every Tuesday you can deploy the new apps that can come out. And as part of that, um, when teachers come together quarterly to meet back and to really converse on, okay, let's review the apps. Is this the best app? Do we need to improve this app? Do we need to take something out? Teachers collectively add their voice to that and say, we may need to change that image. So they will come back. It can be up to four times, if not more, per year that they can change that image to make sure that it's meeting the student's needs. Okay, thank you. And we're about out of time. Um, mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, the question came up about having the same on every iPod pad, but that's been answered. Uh, does, is there any pressing question that I've missed? And if so, uh, either raise your hand, stick at the microphone, or type it quickly in the chat box. Uh, we do need to wrap up in the next two or three minutes so the room can be vacated for the next presentation. Uh, but if you um, don't have any additional questions, please don't forget to register for the drawings that will happen throughout the conference and the iPad, and or, excuse me, after the conference and the iPad drawing that will happen at the conclusion of the conclusion of the conference. Um, I don't see any hands and I don't see any questions. Um, so thank you very much, for, Naomi, for participating. We can give her some clapping hands here. Uh, you've given us a great deal of quality information and thank you for participating. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Nancy, so much for being the moderator. The only last thing I wanted to say, someone brought up about iCloud. Yes, the new version that's coming out for Mac and which for the iPad version, it's going to help us be more seamless with getting those apps to and from computers and your iPad itself by a wireless environment. So please look for that new version. It's going to streamline some of this, this clunky bumpiness with some of this syncing. It's going to get better. And um, the more wireless that we have deployed in our school districts, the more access that we'll have to quality content apps to really help our students gain meaningful knowledge and content. 
um, of information as well. But thank you so much, everyone. I greatly appreciate your time and effort for learning on your weekend. And I hope that I've added or extended learning to your day. But please tap into my resources that I've shared with you, especially on the BoxNet slash Naomi Harm site. You can download, share, and distribute anything that's there. I also have my PowerPoint version there in a PDF for your easy access and to share and would be willing to 